Next up is Dr. KTS Sarao, and as Dr. Sarao sets up his presentation, uh, and you can share it, sir, I will just read out a bit from your profile. Uh, Professor Karam Tej Singh Sarao received the degrees of BA Honours in History with Economics, MA History, MPhil in Chinese and Japanese Studies, and PhD Buddhism from Delhi University. He was awarded with the prestigious Commonwealth Scholarship in 1985 to study at the University of Cambridge, from where he received his second PhD in archaeology in 1989. He began his teaching career in 1981 at Delhi University's Came College. In 1993, he joined the Department of Buddhist Studies, Delhi University, as a reader, where in 1995, he was selected to occupy a professorial chair. Um, in 2000, the Ministry of Culture, Government of India, has conferred on him the basic citation of honor, which is Vaishak Samman. Prashasti Patra uh, for the year 2020. So uh, with that, I will request you, uh, Dr. Stara, to start up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for a very liberal introduction. I am basically going to talk about uh, the controversy that uh, partly still exists with regard to the ownership of Mahabodhika. Uh, the story uh, starts actually with the arrival of uh, the Buddha on the eve of his uh, attainment of Bodhi under this tree, which is now as the Mahabodhi uh, tree, Mahabodhi Viksha. Uh, as you know, um, right uh, at the dawn of civilization, Hindus have been worshipping the people tree. And this specific people tree under which the Buddha came and said had already been, was already uh, being worshipped by the uh, Hindus. And uh, we have sufficient evidence to indicate that even a small shrine existed here. And so the Buddha comes here and uh, then uh, later Ashoka apparently visits this place and with the passage of time, uh, a Bodhi Ghar some sort of bigger shrine comes into existence. And then we have uh, this covered temple, uh, which looked like uh, the one that we have today. It's this temple that's built. Now, uh, right from the beginning, Hindus have been visiting this place and performing the ceremony on the fourth day of their Pindadan. And we also have sufficient evidence um, uh, on the, based on the sources, Buddhist sources, uh, that this temple most probably was built by Tamils. For example, Xuanzang says, uh, the Chinese Buddhist monk who came to India in 629, he says that uh, it was a Brahman who not only that he built this temple, but also the image of the Buddha that exists inside the Sanctum Sanctorum was also made by a Brahman. And uh, of course, uh, during the medieval period, uh, you had Trushka, the Khalidis who came and uh, destroyed most of these uh, uh, places uh, in uh, UP and Bihar, and this temple was abandoned. And then we have this uh, uh, Shaivite Sanyasi, uh, Gir Mahant, who comes to uh, this place and starts looking after this temple. And uh, now, come the uh, Europeans are colonial masters and uh, they have this specific kind of agenda uh, through which uh, they are uh, portraying basically through the ownership of the text and by virtue of for this ownership, these colonial masters of the Victorian period ideologically controlled their interpretation for the Indians. Also, since only they could read the text and this allowed them the freedom to prosecute their own colonial agenda, with the authority of science, uh, Buddhism was used as a sort of tool by these Victorian groups and individuals to promote a certain social, political, or religious agenda. Respect to English domestic as well as colonial policies. And this agenda formed the very basis of the transformation or even creation of Buddhism in and for the Victorian world. 
Now, when you look at the Victorian uh, depiction of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, you see the Buddha on the one hand being um, kind of projected as a sort of uh, uh, a person who like uh, uh, a gentleman from Africa with thick lips and curly hair, uh, but and, and it was a, it, the grandest and the purest religion, with the exception of Christianity. Of course, Christianity was the best religion, and apart from Christianity, Buddhism is the best religion. This is uh, one very interesting thing that the Victorian Indologists are now sort of uh, portraying, and uh, so. In the entire description that is given, uh, right from the beginning of the Victorian period, there had been some 300 years of European interpretation of Hinduism, which had generally been unsympathetic. As for example, one of the scholars who wrote a book uh, uh, a few years ago called The British Discovery of Hinduism, uh, Marshall, Peter Marshall, he writes, even if some intellectual curiosity about Hinduism was aroused, the attitude of the great mass of Europeans who came into contact with this religion was always either ridicule or disgust. Books were filled with accounts of a multiplicity of deities, repellent images, and barbarous customs. So this is the way the, uh, the, the, the Hinduism is uh, uh, being portrayed. Uh, and uh, so to people like William Knighton, who uh, arrived here in 1804, so it was uh, Hinduism is basically a very depraved religion. And it was this depraved religion that motivates the Buddha to renounce all things. So the Buddha, according to him, uh, saw Brahmanism in active operation around him. Of all creeds, Brahmanism is the most foul and soul polluting religion. The frenzied widow shrieking on the funeral pile of her husband under the scorching influence of the flames, the deputies crackling beneath the wheels of Jagannath's car, their dying groans drowned in the horrid music of the Brahmins. Gotham saw all this and a thousand times more than the European public could be told or would believe. So it is this kind of portrayal of uh, Buddhism vis a vis Hinduism is being made by the your Victorian indulgence. So by the late 1830s, the colonial masters of India through the textual had begun to see them and Hinduism as two irreconcilably different religions, whereby Buddhism was quoted as a protest movement, a revolution, egalitarian religion, as Professor S was pointing out, uh, everything good, and uh, Hinduism, very corrupt religion, caste religion, exploitative religion, everything that you could say was bad. So Hinduism is very, very bad religion, and Buddhism is a very good religion. It is this kind of portrayal that you see, the narrative that you see in the uh, writings of Victorian languages. I'm sorry, my screen broke. So we are told that uh, the Buddha being an opponent of Hinduism, so he uh, sort of uh, is made to align with the vast majority of the Victorian. Within a colonial context, it was mainly as a counter to the predominant Hindu system in India that the Buddha could be of use. The Buddha thus created uh, was uh, an opponent of caste and of the priestly system, which supported it, an advocate of social reform. And this social reform then is the project of a polemicist who creates this Buddha, a Buddha who in fact becomes a Martin Luther. And as uh, Professor Elst was also pointing out, uh, strangely even today, um, our friends, uh, uh, also sort of the Buddhism is. Uh, 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 socialistic religion only after the, uh, the, uh, Karl Marx possibly learned everything from uh, the Buddha's teaching and egalitarian religion against caste system, so on and so forth. And uh, so you come across interesting uh, narrative at the hands of people like Alexander Cunningham. For example. So Alexander Cunningham also used the material remains to 
perpetuate this kind of attitude about Buddhism and Hinduism. And uh, so Kaningal's primary aim was to trace the itineraries of the Chinese pilgrims, the Buddhist uh, monks, from the 5th to the 7th century. Thus, instead of a wide-reaching and comprehensive survey, Kaningal selected for investigation only those areas and by them as having ancient So Hindu uh, places are completely ignored that. So Cunningham openly and fiercely mocked uh, Hindus who had perverted the very purity of Indian sculpture, which in its early Buddhist state rivaled the Greeks. So here you have a kind of uh, art which is uh, as good as uh, Hellenistic art and uh, Hindus have uh, completely sort of uh, uh, ruined it and uh, have completely degraded this uh, uh, this art. And uh, the Victorian Indologists also found the Hindu treatment of the image of Buddha very offensive. They also saw that uh, they saw the Buddha not only as a social reformer, as I said, who led a crusade against Hinduism, but also an ally in opposing Hinduism by preaching the perfect equality of mankind, to quote uh, Cunningham, in spite of the menaces of the most powerful and arrogant priesthood in the world, who had the courage to incite his countrymen to assist the forcible abduction of their wives and daughters. Indeed, the Buddhist past was styled by the Victorian Orientalists as the authentic and unadulterated antithesis to the most abominable and degrading system of oppression ever invented by the craft of design. Edwin Arnold's 1893 write-up in the Daily Telegraph, he was the editor of this uh, uh, newspaper, of having seen ignorant and insensitive Maratha peasants performing Shra at the Mahamudi temple. So some of these scholars, uh, uh, Victorian scholars, even resorted to lies to push forward such an agenda. Thus, it is impossible to believe that the assertion, the assertion of uh, the likes of uh, Montgomery Martin and Hamilton Buchanan, that uh, during his visit to the Mahabodhi Temple in 1811, Hamilton Buchanan saw Hindus having built a stair on the outside so that Orthodox may pass up without seeing the porch and thus seeing the hateful image of the Buddha. So, Edwin Arnold, who appears to have got his information directly from uh, people like uh, Alexander Cunningham, was the most mischievous person here. And uh, he was the first person also to come up with this interesting idea that temple should be bought from the Hindus. It would uh, most probably, he says, uh, cost about one lakh rupees, hundred thousand rupees, and that can be easily gathered, and uh, then we can purchase this temple from the Hindus. And uh, so. He has in the, been indulging in now in all kinds of campaign that uh, this temple purely is Buddhist and so solely should belong to the Buddhists. And uh, also towards the end of the 19th century, he finds a perfect disciple in the guise of Anandarik Dharampal who takes up this agenda furious. But before that, uh, when the Burmese requested the Mahan for permission to do repairs at the temple, that is in 1876, uh, the uh, Mahant was very happy. Uh, he said no problem. And Mahant had been very accommodative. And we have sufficient evidence to show that the Mahant was very, very friendly. And no visiting pilgrims, Buddhist pilgrims, ever had any problem. In fact, uh, quite a few very senior royal dignitaries from uh, Myanmar and Thailand actually uh, praised the Mahanta for doing wonderful work. And worshippers who came here 
So when permission was granted to the Burmese to repair this temple, uh, and uh, the uh, Alexander Cunningham and a couple of other scholars started raising uh, all kinds of questions that this temple is being destroyed and vandalized and something should be done to stop this. And so in 1883, Alexander Cunningham, along with J.D. Beglar and Rajinder Lal Mitra, they were given the permission and they excavated the site and the temple was rebuilt at a cost of 100,000 rupees. And most of this money, by the way, was contributed by the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, so, uh, now, the when the when Cunningham and Beglar uh, got permission to do the excavations and uh, rebuild the temple, they were all along playing uh, some kind of uh, uh, dirty game that uh, somehow uh, this temple. Uh, uh, of uh, the egalitarian peace like in Buddhist, and uh, so therefore it has been and, and it has been illegally occupied by the caste Hindus, and so therefore something should be done about it. But when Cunningham and Beglar constructed the new temple, they said it was only repaired, but the temple was nearly reconstructed. They destroyed the original temple almost completely, and. Uh, Initially, these four towers were added, and then there is a porch in front. Those of you who have been to the temple, there are big porches in the front here. None of these things existed in the earlier temple. So, all this temple was the temple was built like this, right? like the Mechanism and the Yard. And uh, uh, the two were actually criticized by uh, some scholars that this is almost vandalism. And now our friend uh, like uh, Angarik Dharampal comes in, and uh, to the Indians, Angarik Dharampal is primarily uh, known as uh, having laid the foundations of an aggressive campaign whose singular agenda was the Mahabodhi temple is purely a Buddhist shrine, only a Buddhist shrine, and hence its ownership must be restored to the Buddhist led by it. So uh, he. Uh, Basically, to some extent, the seeds of communal discord around monuments in India were sown in the late 19th century when this reformer, Arundharik Dharampal, began to pressurize the British government, British Indian government, to put Buddhist monuments under the exclusive Buddhist control. And his most important success story was at both there. He had founded already the Mahabodhi Society uh, in May 1891, whose rhetoric was also in line with the anti-Hindu propaganda of the Victorian industries. In his writings in the Mahabodhi journal that he started, uh, as well as his speeches, which are available, uh, one could see he, that he unequivocally began to contest not only Buddhism's roots in Hinduism, but also the multi-religious history of the Mahabodhi temple. So, Arnold's idea that the Mahantan is followed out, the bought out, uh, that met with no success at all. And uh, so when that did not happen, then, uh, Angarik Dharampal actually sort of accelerates his uh, propaganda and uh, literally the sort of uh, abuse that he indulges in against uh, Hinduism. For example, he calls Hinduism as responsible for vulgar practices of killing animals, stealing, prostitution, licentiousness, lying, drunkenness, so on and so forth. So all kinds of abusive speeches and writings that he indulges in. And uh, he also openly and shamelessly uh, declares that uh, he has basically learned all this from Edwin Arnold, the author of The Light of Nations. And uh, 
So from his perspective, the worship rituals such as painting and clothing, uh, clothing the images performed by the Brahminical priests at the temple amounted to desecration. And uh, thus he declared that uh, whereas the Buddhists not only paid tribute to the Buddha and did not worship him, the Hindus turned the image into a god and thus into an idol perverting the Buddha and his image. Clearly the agenda pursued by some not only divisive but also aggressive. Now, as I pointed out uh, earlier, now since times immemorial, the Buddhists and Hindus had shared their holy space at uh, Bodh Gaya and other places. There was absolutely no problem. So somehow, uh, it was the Victorian Indologists like uh, Cunningham and Edwin Arnold, uh, and at their behest, uh, behest people like um, Angarik Dharampal. So they have a sort of a initiated a kind of aggressive campaign and have been painting Hinduism in the darkest of colors. And so it was in significant ways actually created by the opinions of a select group of Orientalists who were engaged in a prolonged and confused anti-Hindu polemic. And although on the surface it may seem that he was simply trying to restore the image of the Buddha to its rightful place in the Mahabodhi temple, he was himself responding to and at the same time perpetuating a long standing orientalist conception of Hindu Buddhist relations, in which Hindus, through their idolatrous and fetishistic ritualizing, perverted the very image of the Buddha. And uh, so uh, things became pretty serious. Uh, from 1893 onwards, and the British government uh, constituted this body law commission to see as to whether the way of worship of the Hindus, the way Hindus worship the Buddha, and the way Buddhists worship the Buddha, are they different from each other or, uh, or, or, or what? The law commission very clearly uh, recommended that they do not see any difference between the Hindus and the Buddhists in terms of worship of the Buddha. And Anagarik Dhampal said they have clothed the Buddha in the wrong way, so on and so forth. But the law commission pointed out that in certain sects of Buddhism, exactly the same is being done by the Buddhists. And, uh, but Anagarik Dhampal continued with his agenda, so much so that uh, the prince um, from Thailand, uh, Damrong, wrote to Dhampal that uh, he, being a monk, he should not indulge in this kind of stuff. Uh, Buddhism is not brick and mortar, and uh, it's much more than that. And you may spend one lakh rupees uh, on, on purchasing this temple, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, it, 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 it will only do damage. So what you should do is uh, work on the dissemination of the moral truths of Buddhism, so on and so forth, and you should stop this. But this fellow did not listen to this kind of advice by a senior Buddhist, um, and uh, uh, so much so that we have some important Buddhists actually complained to the British government, especially Prince Damron, that this man actually is indulging in kind of activities which are a total disgrace and should be stopped. Uh, anyway, so Dhampal was um, doing all kinds of things to get control of the Mahabodhi temple, but he did not succeed. And now he comes up with another very interesting idea. He brings in a statue of Amitabha Buddha from Japan and tries to install install this image in the Mahabodhi temple. And uh, this uh, Buddha actually didn't look like the Amitabha Buddha, didn't actually look like the Indian Buddha anyway. And, uh, but remember this, uh, that till now, Anagarik Dhampal had full freedom to worship in the temple the way he wanted. There was absolutely no problem. And there were a large number of other worshippers, Buddhist worshippers, who had installed statues here and there in the temple, in the premises of the temple and inside the temple. And there was absolutely no problem. But uh, the so much that uh, now the uh, months people said, no way, you cannot install this uh, statue here. So he was kicked out of the temple. 
and the image that he had placed inside the temple was placed outside the grounds. And uh, Angarik Dampal went and lodged a complaint uh, with the police against uh, the Mahant and his men. And uh, now you have a very serious case where the two sides are using all their resources uh, in the court to uh, win. And uh, the court, the case went all the way to the highest court, uh, the high court in Calcutta, where Anagarik Dhampal lost. And the court was very critical of Anagarik Dhampal of having indulged in this kind of dirty sort of propaganda. And uh, the court said that, uh, of course, the temple is open to both the Hindus and the Buddhists. Buddhists, of course, has a right to worship. There is absolutely no problem. But it is a pluralistic temple, multivalent temple. Hindus have been worshiping, worshiping here too. So there is no way that uh, Hindus could be seen as some kind of encroachers. And so Angarik Dhampal is completely. Uh, Congress and uh, he even uh, approached Hindu Mahasabha uh, to get hold of this temple and uh, he continued with all kinds of propaganda that he could and uh, it went on till 1948 when the Bihar government brought in this legislation that the temple shall be shared by the Hindus and the Buddhists. So you have a management committee for Hindus and for Buddhists. The local DM would be the chairperson but the DM must be a Hindu and uh, then uh, around it's that, 5 o'clock. So 15 years ago um, uh, yeah, 15 years ago. Uh, when, uh, when Nitish Kumar had become uh, the uh, chief minister of Bihar for the first time, uh, Nitish Kumar um, had some problems with the BJP and uh, then he brought in this legislation that uh, the uh, DM doesn't have to be necessarily a Hindu. He could be anybody, even a Muslim. So that uh, was done. And also to make things worse, uh, a terrible terrible thing was done by the UPA, the government under uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, when uh, the Indian government made a recommendation to UNESCO for um, having this uh, status of uh, her heritage monument for the Mahabodhi temple. Shockingly in the application, absolutely no mention is made of Hindus. No mention is made that some portions of the temple actually are Hindus and that Hindus actually um, uh, perform the ceremony on the fourth day of the, um, the um, Pindadhan, everything is left out. So the UPA government gets a clear sort of uh, heritage status for the Mahabodhi temple as a Buddhist temple. So Hindus have been completely removed from here. And uh, so what I have tried to say in uh, this paper of mine is that uh, the Victorian Indologists had this agenda. They saw the seeds and drove a wedge between the Hindus and Buddhists. And uh, Angarik Dhanpal uh, became a very wonderful chela, uh, disciple of the Victorian Indologists and the Empire. And uh, he did all that uh, was done by him. And uh, it's quite possible that this poor fellow did not even understand the kind of landmines that he was walking through when he jumped into this uh, whole uh, politics about the ownership of the Mahabodhi temple. So the role of, uh, in my uh, humble uh, opinion, uh, is, of, of uh, Angarik Dhampal is that uh, all the issues, uh, problems that we see around, including today the uh, um, Ambed Christ and so on and so forth, all these issues that you see with regard to Mahabodhi temple or Buddhism in general, as Professor uh, Else was saying that uh, even today there are a large number of people who believe Buddha was opposed caste system, Buddha was a revolutionary, Buddha was a communist, Buddha was a socialist, uh, Buddha was against uh, Hindu, Buddha was against Brahmins, Buddha opposed this, Buddha opposed that. No such thing actually happened. Dhampal was actually responsible for all the kind of dirty politics that is, is still going on with regard to Mahabharata. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah. Uh, also, thank you for uh, sticking to the time and giving us your view on this important topic.